Few companies in the world are recognizable by just three simple shapes. The Walt Disney Company is one, and it has managed to create an army of diehard fans for almost 100 years. The Walt Disney Company is an international media and entertainment conglomerate that was started in Los Angeles, California in 1923 by none other than Walter Elias Disney himself. Over the years, Disney has made a series of successful acquisitions and built up their brand into the hearts of people around the world. As investors, we must find out not just how great the next Marvel movie might be, but rather whether or not Disney's stock is a good investment and what price we should be willing to pay for it. Disney classifies its businesses into four segments, media networks, parks, experiences and products, studio entertainment, and direct-to-consumer and international. The first segment, media networks, includes Disney's domestic cable channels like ABC, Disney Channel, ESPN, and also channels like FX and National Geographic since the company recently acquired 21st Century Fox. The significant sources of revenue from this segment are from affiliate fees paid by cable providers and TV stations who use the ABC network name, advertising revenue from businesses who pay for commercials and sponsorships on Disney's media content, and finally, from licensing fees for licensing media content to subscription video companies like Netflix, Hulu, or even Disney+. Plus. The next segment, Parks, Experiences, and Products, includes the Disney theme parks and resorts, Disney Cruise Line, and the licensing and sale of Disney's consumer products like that one plush Mickey Mouse we all have somewhere in our house. The significant sources of revenue in this segment are from theme park tickets, sales of merchandise, food, and beverages inside the park, hotel and vacation club revenues from resorts around the world, Disney Cruise Line sales, retail sales of merchandise from physical and online stores, and licensing of Disney brands to other companies. Studio Entertainment, the third segment, includes all the movie productions from Walt Disney Pictures, 21st Century Fox, Marvel, Lucasfilm, and Pixar. It also includes the Broadway productions like Lion King and the music labels Disney has to create their own music and music for other artists. The significant sources of revenue in this segment are from theatrical sales of their blockbuster movies like Avengers and Star Wars, the sales of their movies through physical and digital formats, and finally, from licensing their films and Broadway productions to TV channels and subscription video services like Netflix, Hulu, and Disney+. The final segment of Disney's business is honestly kind of weird. They call it direct-to-consumer and international. This segment includes both direct-to-consumer services like Disney+, Plus, Hulu, and ESPN+, Plus, and it includes the international TV channels like Disney Channel International and ESPN International. To me, it seems strange to include the international media network channels with their DTC subscription services. I think Disney agrees too, because starting next quarter, they're changing their business segments. But we'll talk about this change later. Anyways, the significant revenues from this segment are from subscription fees for products like Disney Plus and Hulu, advertising revenues from the international TV channels and subscription services like Hulu with ads, 
and affiliate fees paid by the cable providers who deliver the international media channels. The final source of significant revenue in this segment is from TV and subscription services fees from selling premium content like UFC fights and premier access to movies like Mulan on Disney+. Now we'll look at the financials of each segment and how the pandemic has affected Disney's operations. It's worth mentioning that Disney's financial year starts and ends around September 30th, instead of December 31st like most other companies. Here are the financial results from the Media Network segment. As you can see, the total revenues actually increased in 2020, and the operating income also increased. The TV slash subscription video on demand, or SVOD, increased by about $2.5 billion in revenue because the media networks sold more content to Disney Plus and Hulu. It may seem strange to think that one segment of a business actually recorded revenues and profits from selling something to another part of the same business but it's completely normal for a business the size of Disney to have multiple smaller segments trade within the organization. Next, we have the financial results from the parks, experiences, and products segment. As you may have guessed, the revenues from theme parks, resorts, and cruises are down significantly from the year before. All of Disney's theme parks and resorts were closed for at least a few months, and some theme parks, like Disneyland in California, have yet to reopen. Theme park attendance is down 49%, and the hotel occupancy is down more than 50% from the year before. Cruise ships have not sailed since the start of the pandemic. The revenue in this segment is down $10 billion from the year before, and it is very uncertain how consumer behavior will change once the pandemic is over. We also don't know when the pandemic will end and when governments will allow Disney to return to their pre-pandemic capacity and operations. This segment has significant risk for the future, but I will say that out of all theme parks in the world, Disney will probably be the last ones to fail due to their sheer size and cult-like following. The next financial results are from the studio entertainment segment. Since theaters have been pretty much closed since the start of the pandemic, Disney hasn't released all the movies they expected in the year. This is obviously why the theatrical distribution revenue has decreased. However, the TV slash subscription video on demand revenue is up since the studio entertainment segment sold more content to Disney Plus and Hulu in the year. Overall, the total revenue is down about $1.5 billion from the year before. It is unknown how consumer behavior will change after the pandemic and whether or not theater sales will return to their previous levels. But I'm not too worried for Disney, since it's obvious people still want Disney, Marvel, and Star Wars movies. So if anything, they can just shift to sell them on their direct-to-consumer platforms if not as many people decide to go to movie theaters. Here are the financial results for the final segment direct to consumer and international. One year ago, Disney Plus didn't exist, so obviously the revenue skyrocketed from the year before. The subscription fees represent the total revenues from Disney Plus, ESPN Plus, and Hulu, even though Disney only owns about 67% of Hulu. The subscription fees revenue increased over $5 billion from the year before. This segment as a whole had a large operating loss, 
because Disney is heavily investing in content for their direct-to-consumer subscription services. So for now, they're not making a profit. Out of all the segments, this segment obviously benefited most from the unfortunate events of the pandemic, and Disney has decided to go full throttle on Disney Plus and other subscription products from now on. Now we'll take a look at Disney's three financial statements for the year. On Disney's income statement, we can see that the total revenue decreased about $4 billion from the year before. Disney also did impairment charges on some of the goodwill they have on the balance sheet. They impaired $5 billion worth of goodwill from their international channels acquired in their 21st Century Fox acquisition. Disney claims that this is a result of the pandemic making the assets less valuable than before. When it all comes down to it, Disney's net income for the year was negative as a net loss of $2.8 billion. Here's Disney's balance sheet for the financial year's end. Disney took on more debt in the year due to the effects of the pandemic, so their cash and cash equivalents increased significantly from the year before. They also impaired some of their goodwill and intangible assets as we discussed before, so the goodwill decreased. In the liabilities section, you'll see that the borrowings increased by about $15 billion, meaning Disney took on about $15 billion more in debt. The new shareholders' equity decreased as a result of the increased debt and goodwill impairment to $83.5 billion. Here's Disney's cash flow statement from the last few years. The operating cash flow was lower in 2019 due to a loss on investments and deferred income taxes that were paid. The operating cash flow in 2020 was lower due to decreased revenues and profits and increased expenses. Disney made similar capital expenditures of about $4 billion in 2020 like they have made in the past. In the financing section, we can see that Disney took on about $18 billion in debt and repaid about $3.5 billion. It's worth mentioning that Disney has not bought back their stock since 2018 due to the Fox acquisition in 2019 and the pandemic in 2020. Now we'll take a look at some qualitative factors to consider by discussing Disney's economic moat and management team. The Walt Disney Company is the perfect example of a business with a wide economic moat. Disney arguably has some of the greatest intangible assets on earth, with thousands of brands and characters that are recognized and loved by people around the world. By Disney's own market research, over 1 billion people around the world identified as true fans of the Disney brand with deep emotional connections. If that number is even half as much as what Disney reported, it may well be the most loved company on earth. Another moat Disney has that arguably isn't as strong as their intangible assets is the efficient scale moat. Disney operates in an industry with few competitors, mostly because of the capital required to make media networks, blockbuster films, theme parks, and distribution relationships. All in all, the Walt Disney Company seems to have one of the largest moats a company can have, which should help them fend off competition for decades to come. Now we'll discuss Disney's management team. Unfortunately, 
Walt Disney no longer runs the company, and hasn't for over 55 years. But fear not, there has been some excellent leadership at the company since Walt passed. For example, Bob Iger became the CEO in 2005 and has made some of the most successful acquisitions of any executive at any company. However, in 2020, Bob Iger stepped down as CEO and would only remain executive chairman of the board until December 2021. The new CEO is Bob Chapek. Chapek has been with the company for almost three decades and has been the chairman of the Parks, Experiences, and Products segment since 2015, along with other less significant roles in the company throughout the years. Chapek was largely responsible for major renovations and additions to Disney's parks, resorts, and cruise line. All of these accomplishments are great, but what is his compensation? As investors, we have to know how it's aligned to reward shareholders. JPEG's base salary is $2.5 million, with a $7.5 million annual bonus. JPEG is also compensated $15 million a year in long-term incentives. This $25 million a year pay package is about half as much as Bob Iger was receiving as CEO which is due to the fact that Chapek is less experienced. The compensation certainly isn't bad, but it's worth noting that Bob Iger is the only executive with a significant number of shares in the company at this time. Only time will tell whether or not Chapek can live up to the success of Bob Iger, and there's a risk that he might not be as skilled and trustworthy as Iger due to the lack of evidence so far. However, I will say that to me, from the conference calls and discussions with analysts, Chapek seems extremely competent with the business and is very adaptable, especially with international growth and changing consumer behavior. It's worth mentioning that Disney's CFO, Christine McCarthy, has been around for over five years and has been successful at identifying key investments for Disney so far. Overall, only time will tell whether or not Bob Chapek and the executive team will be able to produce the same or better returns that Bob Iger has over the past 15 years. In the next video, we'll go over Disney's key ratios, growth figures for the company, and figure out the stock's intrinsic value and buy price. I hope this was helpful. Please leave a like and subscribe if you want more content like this. Comment your questions or thoughts down below and I'll see you again next time.